This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. Way down in the American Southwest sits an icon like no other. Built centuries before Europeans came, Taos Pueblo is simply one of the most spellbinding structures in the whole of North America. With its ochre adobe walls, its clustered dwellings, and perfect placement beneath the vast New Mexico sky, it's arguably one of the Western Hemisphere's architectural masterpieces, on par with other pre-Columbian sites like Colorado's Cliff Palace or Cahokia in Illinois. Yet there's one major difference between Taos Pueblo and its competitors. Unlike so many other traditional dwellings, it's still inhabited. Its Native American owners never resettled, murdered, or driven from their lands. And that means what we see today is not just history, but a living culture, one with local roots stretching back over a thousand years. Today, Geographics is investigating one of the oldest continuously inhabited structures in all of North America, and the fascinating story of the people who built it. Just a few minutes outside the town of Taos, New Mexico, lies a site that has transfixed visitors for centuries. Sitting at 7,200 feet above sea level, Taos Pueblo is the northernmost of the state's 19 pueblos, sovereign nations still run by the North American tribes who originally built them. Like many of the other pueblos, it has been inhabited since time immemorial. First settled way back in the era when Europe's premier pastime was still dying of plague. Yet Taos Pueblo has something that sets it apart from others of its kind. Something that makes it unique, even stacked up against other ancient dwellings. To date, it's the only inhabited Pueblo to be inscribed on UNESCO's World Heritage List, joining famous sites like the Pyramids and Stonehenge. So. Let's try and demonstrate exactly what makes it so special. The most obvious starting point is the architecture. You're a modern human in the 21st century. You've probably come across images of Taos Pueblo while madly scrolling Instagram in lockdown. You already know that it's beautiful. Yet even the best photo can only showcase a fraction of its visual power. Like many structures in the area, Taos Pueblo is made of adobe, a form of mud mixed with straw that's poured to make walls that are several feet thick. This means resurfacing the exteriors is a constant ongoing battle, one that requires new thick layers to be added frequently, giving the walls a pleasingly uneven, almost organic look. Nor is it only the surfaces that are forever in a state of flux. When the Pueblo was first built, it didn't just come into being looking as it does today. Instead, new sections were added over time as families expanded and the need for space grew. With each of the blocks representing a self-contained living area, one attached to but not connected with the others, that meant adding new rooms or floors as the need dictated. Taos Pueblo today, then, is a distinct beast from Taos Pueblo in the 15th or 18th centuries. In fact, if you had a time-traveling DeLorean, you wouldn't even need to go back beyond your great-grandparents' lifetime to see it in an entirely different form. That's because the original Pueblo never had doors. Entrances were in the rooftops, and the only windows were thin slits glazed with mica. It wasn't until the 1890s, long after New Mexico had been absorbed into the US, that the first ground-level doorways appeared. The tribe didn't even allow modern windows until the 1930s. Still, for all its exciting sense of change, some things have remained constant. Even today, the community doesn't allow running water or electricity. But since most members live full-time in more conventional homes outside the site, only returning for ceremonies, the impacts aren't as great as you might imagine. Speaking of the local community, it's time we looked at the Pueblo's other great feature. Its culture. Inhabitants of the area for over a thousand years, the Taos Indians, as they refer to themselves on their website, today number roughly 2,000 in the immediate area, with other tribal members living further afield. The speakers of the Tiwa language, they call their home at the place of the Red Willows, which is a single word that I'm not going to try and pronounce. Interestingly, Tiwa is only a spoken language with no widely written written form. Nor is this the only enigmatic aspect of their culture. Members of the Taos Pueblo have a custom of not discussing their ancestral religious beliefs or oral history with strangers. Still, we wouldn't want you to go away thinking this is some closed-off world impenetrable to outsiders. The vast majority of the Pueblo speak both English and Spanish as well as Tiwa and practice Catholicism alongside ancestral religion. Prior to COVID, they were also happy to invite visitors inside to observe their culture. Yet Perhaps the most impressive thing about the Indians of Taos Pueblo is something that can't be seen, their deep connection to their home. 
Unlike in a reservation, the community inhabiting the Pueblo is non-removed, meaning that they were never driven from their lands. And that means they have something else too, an incredible ongoing history. It was around 900 AD when the first humans are thought to have set foot in Taos Valley. Known as the Ancestral Puebloans, they had traveled along the tributaries of the Rio Grande on a great migration, sticking close to water sources, penetrating ever deeper into the southwest. As they went, they forged the beginnings of multiple Pueblo cultures, creating a common route for many of the tribes that still live in the region today. One of the cultures they eventually formed was the Taos Indians. By around the turn of the first millennia, the first settlements were taking shape in the valley. But these dwellings weren't anything like the UNESCO site that we see today. Rather, the first inhabitants lived in small, circular pit houses. It would take until 1200 AD for the original Pueblos to appear, and until 1250 for them to start growing in height and interlocking, forming around communal kivas or courtyards. But once that leap had been made, it was only a matter of time before something architecturally amazing happened. The first attempt came shortly after at a site known as Cornfield Taos. A kind of dry run for the masterpiece that is Taos Pueblo, the Cornfield site had many of the same features. The same expanding, shifting nature that typifies its more famous brethren. What it didn't have, though, was the Pueblo's longevity. At some point in the 13th or 14th centuries, Cornfield Taos was abandoned for reasons that remain unclear. Some sources talk of possible conflict, others of drought. Whatever the driving force behind the move, by 1400 the culture that had built Cornfield Taos had relocated due west, closer to the river. It was here on this new site that the Taos Pueblo was born. Since the exact timing is kind of fuzzy, it's not certain if the Pueblo's earliest buildings, the Grand South House and North House, are the oldest continually inhabited structures in the USA. They may have been pipped by the nearby Acoma Pueblo. What is certain is that from its earliest years, the Taos Pueblo sat at the center of a vast trade network, one that spread along the Rio Grande and up into the northwest where the Plains tribes lived. It even hosted a great festival every fall, showcasing agricultural produce from all across the region. Sadly, that importance meant that Pueblo would inevitably catch the eye of the continent's unwanted new guests the conquistadors yes it's time for that most depressing part of pre-columbian history when it stops being pre and the white man comes across the sea bringing pain and misery for the inhabitants of Taos Pueblo, the fateful moment came in 1540 when Francisco Vasquez de Coronado rode into their valley looking for the fabled Seven Cities of Gold. Supposedly, the flags of Mica growing in the adobe walls convinced him that the Pueblo was one of them, which seems unlikely until you remember this is a man who genuinely considered magic cities made of precious metals to be a believable rumor. It was the beginning of European contact with the people of the Pueblo, and as with most native contact with Europeans, sadly would not end well for the locals. By 1598, the Spanish had established a mission at Taos, the foundations of the modern town. It was also the foundation of a system of horrific exploitation. Back in 1513, the conquistadors had established something known as requerimento, but which more accurately could have been called ways in which we shall act like giant penises. At its heart lay a policy of forced conversion for natives and the destruction of ancestral religions. But the depravity went even deeper. Conquered peoples would be affected enslaved, made to give up their grain and work at back-breaking labor for the colonists. For those who resisted, the Spanish had a special warning to be read aloud in villages. We will take you and your wives and children and make them slaves, and as such we will sell them and will dispose of you and will do to you all the harm and evil we can. It was the beginning of the subjugation of the Taos Pueblo, of a catastrophic era of darkness. And sadly, it would continue for centuries. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a moment, but first, here's a word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching deep into the savings accounts to start a new business or launch a new blog. The world is yours and Squarespace is the platform to use when you're ready to get started on the next web project that you've been thinking about. Are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Bam! Use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want, with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design, if you're so inclined, or maybe just messing around with the colors a little bit, there are many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member 
member only areas, analytics, commercial options, 20% customer support. Really, everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to it. To see the devastating effects Recreamento had on native peoples, look no further than population estimates. While hard data are impossible to come by, the most commonly cited figure for the number of Pueblo Indians living across the region in 1600, just after the Spanish built their first mission, is 80,000. By 1680, that had dropped to a mere 17,000. A population collapse like that wasn't just horrific, it was annihilation, the closest thing to a literal apocalypse. That you can get. Through a combination of disease and cruelty, the Spanish had turned a once thriving region into a wasteland. Nowhere was spared these ravages, not even the Taos Pueblo. Yet it was also at Taos that the seeds of resistance would be sowed. Despite the threat of enslavement and torture, the inhabitants had not meekly accepted Spanish rule. In 1660, they'd risen up, killed the priest, imposed on them, and destroyed the hated San Geronimo de Taos church. But while that revolt had been put down, it would be another revolt planned at Taos Pueblo that would change the course of New Mexican history, even if the man behind it was originally from a different tribe. Pepe was a war captain of O.K. Oinga and a widely respected spiritual leader. In 1675, he'd looked around at life under the Spanish, the empty villages, the vanishing Pueblo and cultures, and decided, you know what? This sucks. Calling a conference, Pepe declared the need to return to traditional practices, to resist European attempts to colonize minds and behavior, to which the Spanish responded the only way they knew how, with brutal violence. Since traditional practices were banned as sorcery, Pepe and 46 other leaders were arrested, while others were hanged. Pepe was flogged in public, a humiliation he'd never forget. In the wake of his punishment, Pepe went into hiding at Taos Pueblo. There, he came up with a plan of action that would go down in history. Using long-distance runners, Pepe dispatched messages to Pueblean Indians scattered over a 400-mile area, preparing them for a revolution. Since not all spoke common language, he gave his runners knotted ropes. Each day, a knot would be undone. On the day that the last knot was undone, everyone would rise up at once. It was a crazy plan, one which took years to finalize. But the thing about crazy plans is that sometimes they work better than anyone expected. On August 10, 1680, the knots ran out and a revolution swept the southwest. Pepe's followers attacked haciendas, set fire to churches, blocked roads, and destroyed water supplies. Cunningly, they also stole as many horses as they could, leaving the Spanish with no easy means to flee as they marched on Santa Fe. All told, some 400 Spanish would die in the Pueblo Revolt. More importantly, the survivors would abandon the area, retreating all the way south to El Paso. There, they would remain, repelled and humiliated for 12 whole years. Today, the Pueblo Revolt is recognized as the most successful native revolution in the whole of North America, on par with the revolution of Tupac Amaru II down in Peru. It's been called the first American revolution, although its effects weren't anywhere near as long-lasting. After Pepe died in 1688, Governor Diego de Vargas launched a plan of reconquest, eventually subduing the Pueblo peoples in 1692. Always a hotbed of discontent, Taos Pueblo tried to rise up twice more, once in 1694 and once in 1696, but they never again succeeded at expelling the Spanish. Yet the revolt wasn't all in vain. To take back the region, Diego de Vargas was forced to rely on a policy of amnesty in the aftermath agreed to give the Pueblo Indians concessions. No longer would they be forced to abandon their ancestral religions, no longer would the demands of Recreimiento see them enslaved. While the relationship between the two sides would remain uneasy for a long time, a turning point had been reached, one of those axes around which history so often pivots, setting us on the path to a new future. A future in which the culture of the Pueblo peoples would survive. As the 18th century slipped by, the friction between the Puebloans and their Spanish overlords began to lessen, never smoothing away, but certainly reducing. Partially, this was due to Spain's increased emphasis on being less dickish to its subjects. Partially, it was due to having a common cause in repelling Utes and Comanche attacks. Sadly, this tentative peace wouldn't last, because it's time we introduced our second great conqueror into the story, the United States of America. 
The causes of the Mexican-American War are complex and way too twisty for us to go into today. If you want an excellent primer, we actually did a whole video on it over on our other channel, War of Graphics. For today, though, all you need to know is that in 1846, war erupted between the United States and Mexico, a war that included some serious land grabbing by Uncle Sam. Lands like the whole of New Mexico. For the Taos Indians, the arrival of the Americans was less, woo, liberation, and more, Christ, not again, Jesus. Rather than accept annexation, a Taos Pueblo leader named Tomasito joined forces with Mexican politician Pablo Montoya and launched what they hoped would be a sequel to the 1680 revolt. At first, things went to plan. The rebels attacked the house of Governor Charles Bent, allegedly scalping him before murdering several government officials. But then someone managed to get word to the U.S. garrison in Santa Fe, and the revolt ended not with a whimper, but with the mother of all bangs. Chased back to Taos Pueblo, the rebels took refuge in the San Geronimo Mission Church. The U.S. Army bombarded it with cannon fire until the church was in ruins and scores of rebels lay dead. Of the survivors, nearly 30 would be hanged. But while the revolt ended in failure, the citizens of Taos Pueblo would never suffer the full indignities that the U.S. bestowed on other Native Americans. While the Navajo, Comanche, Cherokee, Seminole, and countless others were either partially or totally evicted from their ancestral lands, the Pueblo tribes of New Mexico were allowed to stay put, to keep living in the homes their people had built long before Mr. and Mrs. Columbus ever decided to do some baby-making. But that doesn't mean Washington wasn't still going to screw the Taos Indians over, hence the 1903 decision to confiscate the Pueblo's most significant spiritual site. Nestled up in the nearby mountains, Blue Lake is the Taos Indians' equivalent of the Vatican, a site of unimaginable spiritual importance. Up there, away from prying eyes, rituals and ceremonies have been conducted for centuries, each a key moment in the life of the community. Yet all this meant nothing to the bureaucrats at the Department of Interior. In 1903, they swiped the land surrounding the Pueblo for a temporary forest reserve. Only it turns out someone crossed their fingers when they called it temporary. Three years later, President Roosevelt made the confiscation permanent. And just like that, Taos Pueblo lost 80% of their land to the Carson National Forest. For the next two decades, the community would fight to have it returned. For two decades, they'd keep running headlong into a wall of indifference. Finally, in 1927, the Secretary of Agriculture agreed to a compromise. In return for access rights for foraging in the forest and a guarantee that they could hold ceremonies at Blue Lake in private, the Taos Indians would stop their protesting. For the Pueblo, this was a little like having someone steal your TV, then agree to let you watch Saturday Night Football if you quit bitching. As far as they were concerned, they shouldn't have to compromise on what was theirs. But realistically, what could they do? Over the following decades, the issue festered. As more time passed, more tourists started flocking to the Pueblo's sacred lands, littering, fishing in Blue Lake, generally acting like entitled douchebags. Thankfully, though, the end of the 1960s would see things change for the better. And that change would partially hinge on one of the least likely people in America, Richard Nixon. By the 1960s, the Taos Indians had slowly regained rights regarding their confiscated lands. The U.S. Forest Service eventually banned fishing in Blue Lake. The issuance of visiting permits was placed in the hands of Pueblo leaders. But the central issue was still being ignored, that the locals wanted back what was rightfully theirs. In 1965, the Taos Pueblo even made an offer to forego the $300,000 the Indian Claims Commission awarded them in return for getting the land around Blue Lake back. Yet the government refused, unwilling to set a precedent for returning confiscated lands. So local activists decided that they'd just have to change the government from the inside. In the late 1960s, the Taos Pueblo reached out to LaDonna Harris to ask if she would support their cause. A half-Comanche native rights activist, Harris was likely to be sympathetic. But she also had a secret weapon that few other activists had, a husband, Fred Harris, who sat in Congress as senator for Oklahoma. Together, the Pueblo activists and the two Harrises would make sure the return of Blue Lake became Washington's biggest cause celeb. Over the following years, LaDonna and Fred kept raising the issue, pushing it like no other. Cleverly, they framed everything in terms the voting public could understand. Blue Lake itself was talked of as a religious issue. The confiscation of lands presented as government overreach. By 1970, Fred Harris had managed to table a bill before Congress. But there was still one major worry. 
whether the president would sign. As a partisan Democrat, Fred Harris was one of Richard Nixon's bitterest enemies, the sort of guy whose organs Nixon would rather sell to zoos for food than cooperate on a bill with. There was genuine fear the president could veto returning Blue Lake. Which just goes to show how even in his own time, people misjudged Nixon. Because rather than just a cartoon villain, the 37th president was also a guy deeply concerned with Native American rights. As a young man, Nixon had been coached by a Luceno Indian, who became almost a second father to him. The result was that Tricky Dick spent his entire career as an unlikely champion for American Indian causes. When he ran for president in 1968, he had done so partially on a platform of improving relations with native peoples. So when Fred Harris put his bill forward, Nixon didn't mobilize his forces to kill it. Rather, he championed it. In 1970, the Senate voted 70 to 12 to return Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo, the first time the government ever returned land confiscated from Native Americans. It was perhaps the single biggest event in Taos Pueblo's modern history, a moment still celebrated by the community today. As Nixon himself noted as he signed Fred Harris's bill, this is a bill that represents justice, because in 1906 an injustice was done in which land involved in this bill, 48,000 acres, was taken from the Indians involved, the Taos Pueblo Indians. The Congress of the United States now returns that land to whom it belongs. At long last, after centuries of exploitation, neglect, and theft, the Taos Pueblo were finally being recognized for what they were, rightful owners of the land their ancestors had settled over a thousand years ago. Today, Taos Pueblo is both a sovereign nation and a popular tourist destination, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and an ever-evolving community. Of course, issues remain. Since the 1990s, there have been vigorous debates within the Pueblo around the impacts of over-tourism. Meanwhile, the pandemic saw the entire area closed off to visitors to stop the virus getting in and devastating the community. As the Pueblo's head of tourism, Iona Spruce, bluntly put it, Worldwide, there are only 2,800 of us, so each death is significant. Despite these hardships, though, it's hard not to regard Taos Pueblo with something like awe. Here stands not only an architectural masterpiece that has existed for centuries, but an entire culture that dates back even longer. A culture that predates European arrival in North America. Yet this isn't some fossil, a relic of a bygone time where you can pay to see people dressed up like they're in the southwest version of colonial Williamsburg. No, this is a living place, one that's constantly evolving, just as the houses of the Pueblo itself have evolved, changing and adapting with the times while never losing its roots. At the end of the day, this may be the most inspiring thing about Taos Pueblo of all.